Welcome everybody. My name's Phil Bryant and I look after one of the advisory teams here at Acuity. Um, we've run a number of these webinars during lockdown, uh, looking at topics such as investment considerations, protection, uh, estate planning. And we've been asking our clients what other topics they would like to look at. And we've had a lot of requests to look and explore uh, shareholder protection. As with all of our webinars, uh, we need to make it clear that this is not a platform to provide specific tailored advice. Uh, rather a way that we can highlight areas that our clients should consider addressing uh, and some high level planning strategies that they could adopt. Um, we would suggest that if you do require specific advice um, that you contact us directly and ar arrange a consultation with either myself or, or one of my team and we'll be happy to, to provide that. And as with all the consultations that we are providing during lockdown, uh, they're free of charge. So firstly today uh, we'll have a quick look at why we need shareholders protection and then specifically what a cross option agreement is and then finally we'll, we'll look at a tax efficient solution how that how that works in in action so why do we need a shareholder uh, why do we need shareholder protection um, so what happens to your company if a major shareholder dies well the answer is you can't be sure uh, and that's clearly not a good position for us to be in so uh, picture your predicament uh, a senior colleague uh, and shareholder in your company is, is, is very sadly died and naturally their nearest and dearest inherit the estate uh, which includes their shares and suddenly your company is part owned by someone or several someone's who may have no knowledge of your business yet they now have a say in how it's run or on the other hand they may well have no interest whatsoever in running that company with you either way uh, as you'll appreciate it's not a sustainable situation so the obvious uh, solution to that uh, is for uh, the people who have inherited the shares to simply sell them back to you but this means you have to find the money to, to fund that and your company simply may not have that much spare cash lying around and this is specifically why uh, companies with, with with a few major shareholders are strongly advised to take out shareholder protection so as we can see losing a business owner is very likely to have a huge impact on the running and sustainability of day-to-day -day operations as well as losing that individual's experience skill uh, and contributions significant conflicts of interest can arise between the remaining shareholders and the estate beneficiaries much as we don't think that will happen um, we've seen that happen in, in a number of cases and this situation can ultimately cripple a business so when distributing the deceased's shares, the recipients may prefer to sell them and uh, the remaining shareholders may have no say in that. So in which case, um, the remaining shareholders clearly like to purchase them. But as mentioned, what if they don't have the necessary capital available? And this is why uh, shareholder protection plays such a vital role. And the level of, level of cover that each business owner receives is determined by their equity and value of their shareholding. And once the insurance is agreed and in place, payments to the beneficiaries are made upon on death or, or sometimes on critical illness. So it goes without saying that the impact will be felt far beyond the business, uh, which is why the first benefit of shareholder protection is to support the bereaved family. Um, because during an already incredibly difficult time, family members and other beneficiaries simply might not want to take an interest in the business. So to keep things simple and minimize stress, they might prefer the cash equivalent. And shareholder protection provides exactly that in a straightforward and fair manner. The lump sum could be used to financially support them after losing a breadwinner or to pay an inheritance tax liability without having to liquidate other assets. And the shareholder protection also provides continuity for the business. So every sustainable long-term business plan should consider unforeseen circumstances. And much like in personal financial planning, having protection in place will help underpin the business's future. So the beneficiaries might not possess the skills, the experience or any interest in, in continuing as part of that business. And they would have just lost a loved one. It might not be, as you can expect, the best time for an entrepreneurial endeavor. So with shareholder protection, the surviving business owners will have prior authority, which is very important, and the capital to purchase the shares. They won't need to waste any time and resources finding another investor or trying to raise funds via a buyout. And this gives peace of mind for all the, all the stakeholders, all the shareholders involved. And a challenging, challenging situation uh, can be resolved with, with significantly less hassle.
So the shareholder protection, it provides support for the shareholder. Um, the shareholder protection can be used to ensure against critical illness as well as death. So this typically includes nasty things such as you know, heart attack, forms of cancer. In this circumstance, if the shareholder falls ill, given the right agreements have been put in place, they can then sell their shares to another shareholder and the funds are available to do that. So again, this reduces the stress in very difficult circumstances. Also provides financial stability for the shareholder and their family when they are unlikely uh, to be able to work. But most importantly, it frees up time for them to hopefully recover and spend valuable time with their family and friends. So how does a shareholder protection um, insurance work? So shareholder protection is, is arguably the most sophisticated of business protection products. And fundamentally, uh, the shareholder needs to establish life cover that reflects and represents their shareholding value. And there are several different factors that must be considered before you can get suitably protected. And these range from the basics, so how are you planning to purchase your cover, uh, moving up to the more sophisticated uh, shareholder and cross option agreements. And these are the agreements that underpin what will happen to the shares in the event that a payout is triggered. What is a cross option agreement? It might be a term that you haven't heard of, uh, might be a term that you, that you have, you might have heard it in a, in a different way because a cross option agreement is sometimes referred to as a double option or a put and call arrangement. And it's the preferred vehicle for shareholder protection because it provides the surviving shareholders with the option to buy the deceased business owner's share of the business. And that word option is, is crucial. Uh, in addition to the surviving shareholders being able to call their option to buy the shares, the legal representatives of the deceased estate also have the same option and they have the option to sell their shares back to the business owner and the remaining shareholders. So in either case, uh, whether the remaining business owners want to buy the shares or the legal representatives want to sell, the agreement ensures the option is exercised. And as I said, it's really important that the cross option agreement is set up in this manner to ensure that there is no binding sale. And what we mean by this is that in certain circumstances, neither party could necessarily exercise their option. And this is really important because this means business property relief for inheritance tax purposes can be preserved. And this essentially means that no inheritance tax will be liable, which is very, very important to consider. So in the process of setting up the appropriate business protection, it should also involve setting up a cross option agreement with all the directors or partners in the business, enabling the remaining directors or partners to purchase the shares of the business from the deceased estate. And this agreement in turn provides the dependents with a willing buyer and with cash instead of shares. Um, so it, it really does try to put the right people remaining in control of that business and ensuring it can run smoothly. So if we've got no cross option in place and there is say just a standard will, um, the implications for beneficiaries are that beneficiaries will now own part of the company, uh, which they may not want to run as we've said. Shares in the company are now part of the beneficiary's estate and therefore they are at risk from future divorce, remarriage, uh, bankruptcy and long-term care payments. All of the risks, and those that have seen any of the estate planning webinars that we've, we've looked at, all of the risks associated with absolute ownership. If the beneficiaries decide to sell the business, then the proceeds will enter their estates, which creates a potential inheritance tax liability. The implications for the surviving shareholder, Director B in this diagram, are that they may not want to run a company in partnership with Director A's beneficiaries. And as mentioned, they may not have the funds to buy out Director A's share of the business, so they reach an impasse. So if we look at um, a basic cross-option planning, so cross-option without trust planning, um, this is the structure that we previously mentioned. Uh, life insurance is set up to provide the funds to the company to buy out the deceased shareholder shares. Uh, the company receives the life insurance proceeds and the deceased shareholder beneficiaries receive the shares. The cross-option agreement then, in effect, exchanges these. So the implications for beneficiaries now are the funds from the life assurance policy. And these funds are now, as the shares were in the previous example, these funds are now forming part of their estate. And so will be assessed for inheritance tax when they die. And these funds are also at risk from the same things mentioned earlier, claims from divorce, remarriage, bankruptcy, and long-term care fees. 
The implications here for the surviving shareholder, again, Director B, that they now own 100% of the limited company. And that 100% is at risk from the same things again, divorce, remarriage, bankruptcy, and long-term care. And with trading uh, business property relief, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's applicable. However, if they sell the business, the cash proceeds will then be part of their estate. And so they will be assessable for inheritance tax when they die. So in addition, with regards to capital gains tax, because that's important on sale of a business, the growth in Director B share has increased and hence there's going to be a, a, a significant CGT liability there as well. So if we look at the solution, we want to, to really incorporate all the benefits of, of the cross option agreement and the cover that's funded to buy out the shares, but we want to do so in the most tax efficient way possible. So here we use the cross option agreement structure as outlined previously, but crucially we include the use of trusts within that structure. Here we include a family business trust and this will have the shares directed to it and the deceased shareholders beneficiaries will control and benefit from them, but they won't own them. Each director then leaves their share of the business uh, to their respective family business trusts and a cross option agreement is established as we've said, enables one director to purchase the other director's shares of the business. And these life insurance policies are taken out to fund that, that purchase. So put simply, uh, the proceeds of the life cover will be held in the shareholder trust. And the surviving shareholder or shareholders will control and benefit from them. But crucially, due to the trust structures, neither the deceased shareholders family all the surviving shareholder and their family will physically own those assets outright. They will be owned by the trusts and they will be trustees and beneficiaries. And that is crucial because that protects these assets from the risk we mentioned earlier. So to put this in a, in a, in a bit more detail, um, the real beneficiary, uh, the real benefits for the beneficiaries are that those cash proceeds are held in the, the family trust, not in the beneficiaries' estates. So those funds cannot be assessed against anyone for inheritance tax purposes. The funds are now also protected from the risk of claims of future divorce, remarriage, bankruptcy and long term care. So we're protecting those assets in the most tax efficient way possible. The benefits for the surviving shareholder, again, Director B. Um, Director B still physically owns 50% of the company, but the other 50% is owned by the shareholder trust, of which Director B with his family are trustees and beneficiaries. So they have access to those funds, access to those shares, but they don't physically own them within their estate. So they can make all the decisions on their own. They don't need to ask anyone. They funded that buyout, but they've done it in the most tax efficient way possible without outright, outright ownership. So if Director B wishes to sell the business, only 50% of the sale proceeds will enter his estate. So essentially it's cutting the liability in half. The other 50% will belong to the trust. The 50% of sale proceeds owned by the trust is protected and cannot be assessed against Director B for inheritance tax purposes. The 50% of sales proceeds owned by the trust is also protected from the risk of claims from remarriage, bankruptcy and long-term care. And lastly, half of any dividend payments would be into the shareholder trust. So these can be distributed to the beneficiaries in the trust. So the shareholder trust can actually be used as a really powerful income planning tool. So as we can see, um, no planning is a business risk and it's a, it's a significant business risk. But basic planning, where people think it's, it's taken care of or it's done in the correct way, will provide a tax risk. So in terms of shareholder protection structuring, it is essential to get this right. And when it is established, it is vital to ensure that it is reviewed so it remains fully fit for purpose. And um, say for our clients, we're happy to review any existing strategies or, or to discuss and establish new efficient and effective approaches to shareholder protection. So I hope that you found that useful. I'll now pass back to, to Rosie and we can address any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Phil, excellent. So if anyone has any questions, please send them in on the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And we did have a couple that were sent in um, before this webinar, Phil. So I'll begin with them. But as I said, if okay. anyone's got any questions, please send them in. Um, so we had somebody ask, is shareholder protection something you can just go out and buy online? And perhaps you just covered this in part in saying that, that it's a bit more complicated than that. Yeah, so it's, it's, 
if you think about protection and you, and you and you could probably make a case for saying if you're just trying to cover the liability on a on a main residence on a mortgage it's very hard it's very easy just to say i know exactly how much that is i know exactly what the term of that mortgage is i can go on and buy that direct myself because there's only two variables but with regards to shareholder protection and the intricacies with regards to how those trusts interact the valuation process um, in terms of what cover to establish is incredibly important and it's quite hard to establish unless you know how to do that and also to make the trusts uh, work in the way that we described there that is a bespoke exercise for each individual company and each individual director and it looks different depending on uh, the size of the company the value of the company and the number of shareholders involved so i would say in, in terms of what we look at protection wise this, this is probably one of the most uh, sophisticated um, pieces of strategy that we look at Okay, and your answer there touched on another question we had is in how do you value value a business for the purpose of stakeholder protection? That's a very good question. And um, there are different ways in which you can do this. Um, throughout the times that we've investigated these solutions for our clients, um, we can look at fair value, which essentially is all the shareholders sit around a table and agree a valuation that they think is currently applicable to the firm. As long as they all agree and it represents fair value, we can proceed on that basis and then review that value moving forward. The other option, uh, which as you can imagine, not a tremendous amount of our clients uh, opt for, is to have a professional valuation. But you need to have three different professional valuations and then you take an average of the three. But each valuation takes a significant amount of time and also incurs a significant amount of costs. So when there's, when there's a small team of, of, of leaders within the firm, as long as they are agreeing and in agreement, we have a starting position, which we can then review and modify moving forward. OK, great. And the other question we had, um, the last question, actually, was if you're a husband and wife business, is shareholder protection as important? So I would say shareholder protection itself, in terms of just the word shareholder protection it is as important but in terms of the cross option agreement strategy and structure that we would look at that becomes less appropriate because what we're guarding for here is when there's two different directors and two different families involved and we want to make that process as smooth as possible when there's a husband and wife involved we would look at protection for the same reasons that we would look at uh, corporate protection for, for for any other company but we wouldn't necessarily structure that cross option agreement uh, planning within it so again it's uh, each case is different so it would require a you know a review uh, and an understanding of, of how they they work and, and what they're trying to achieve through the company and really what they're trying to protect okay excellent phil well that's all the, that's all the questions nobody on the call today has submitted a question um so back over to you to close up phil okay um well thank you everyone for joining um i hope that's that's been useful i know it, it potentially is quite heavy going in terms of the detail. Um, unfortunately, that's the subject matter, but it's important to, to get that right and go through that detail. Um, again, thank you for attending. I believe there's going to be some email contacts that are going to be sent out on the back of the, um, uh, the webinar today. And we'd be very happy uh, to engage with regards to any situations that you want us to look at and any advice that you, that you require on, on the back of that. So look forward to getting in touch and say we're here for you and we're here to help you. So look forward to speaking to some of you. Great. Thank you very much, Phil. And thank you for everyone for joining the call today.